Which planet has 14 moons named after sea nymphs? A 165-year orbit around the sun ravaging supersonic winds and just one close-up image taken by a spacecraft? The answer to that question is Neptune. The eighth planet from the sun and the third largest planet in terms of mass after Jupiter and Saturn isn't often depicted in the family photo albums of the solar system. Nearly 33 years have passed since the first and only close flyby of Neptune by a spacecraft performed by NASA's Voyager 2. Nothing has returned to Neptune since it did on August 25, 1989, marking the end of Voyager's grand tour of the solar system's four big planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. Voyager 2, in the meantime, has gotten into interstellar space. What Neptune-related studies are there, and why do experts believe it's time to travel back? Our failure to thoroughly investigate Neptune is a significant loss, because planets of this size have turned out to be relatively prevalent in the Milky Way. It restricts our understanding of the solar system and the galaxy. There are nearly nine times as many planets in the galaxy that are the same size as Uranus and Neptune as there are planets that are much larger and are the same size as Jupiter and Saturn. A lot may be learned about the development of our own solar system from the impact scars that appear to be on the outermost planets. In order to improve our knowledge of how planetary systems are formed and where to hunt for planets that potentially support life, there is an increasing sense of urgency to explore Neptune. It takes a spaceship a long time to get to Neptune, and we've only done it once. NASA launched a nuclear-powered spacecraft called Voyager 2 in 1977 to pass by each of the solar system's large planets while taking advantage of a rare planetary alignment. Voyager 2 crossed Neptune in August 1989. The spacecraft's detection of a temperature in the atmosphere of about minus 360 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 220 degrees Celsius and wind speeds of up to 2,100 kilometers per hour during the encounter that revealed Neptune to be more active than previously thought, suggesting that the planet's interior heat may be responsible for these phenomena. Like Saturn and Jupiter, Neptune was described as a blue gas giant by Voyager 2's discovery of six new moons, Proteus, Larissa, Despina, Galatea, Thalassa and Naiad. Voyager 2 also discovered four new rings around Neptune. The blue colour is due to the presence of methane gas in the environment. The largest storm, an anticyclone the size of Earth that resembled Jupiter's famous great red spot as seen by Voyager 2, roared across the planet's surface. The great dark spot was the name given to the enormous storm. Unlike Jupiter, Saturn and Pluto, which were photographed by the Galileo, Cassini and New Horizons missions in highly precise detail, Neptune and Uranus were captured by Voyager 2 in rather simplistic photographs. Therefore, even though we know Neptune has dark belts, dazzling clouds of methane ice and cyclonic storms, only a specialized expedition might reveal the specifics of the physics responsible for its atmospheric conditions. Over 30 years have passed in darkness. All of the close-ups and large images of Neptune's disk are from JPL's photo journal which was assembled after Voyager made its final exit from the inner solar system. Voyager is largely responsible for what we actually know about Neptune. Voyager 2 significantly expanded our understanding of Neptune, but since then, progress has been slow due to the difficulty of using telescopes to observe the outer planets. Large ground-based observatories like the Keck Observatory in Hawaii have allowed for limited studies of Neptune's weather, but practically all of what is known about atmospheric characteristics comes from Voyager 2. Only 0.001 times as much sunshine hits Neptune as reaches Earth. Voyager 2's camera had to use a long exposure to capture images in such a dim environment. Unfortunately, it was moving too quickly for such to be possible without seriously causing image blur. For this reason, during its closest approach, thrusters were activated aboard Voyager 2 
to help rotate the spacecraft and keep its camera pointed on Neptune. NASA's Deep Space Network antennas in Spain, Australia, Mexico and California had to be stretched to 230 feet or 70 meters due to the distance from Earth. Neptune's images from Voyager 2 took four hours to arrive on Earth. If we look at past spending, space explorations have cost enormous sums of money. There have already been previous projects that cost $6.3 billion, $25.4 billion and over $160 billion. People who aren't particularly interested in science would probably respond by asking why we shouldn't spend so much money on Earth since we already have so many issues. Because space exploration would cover their costs, even private investors do not see the benefit of doing so. Neptune's exploration by NASA will profoundly impact our understanding of the universe, as the mission will not only pay for itself, but will also bring back a significant amount of money to Earth. So, why have the last three decades been spent ignoring Neptune? It wasn't wholly overlooked, after all. Ground-based telescopes and Hubble Space Telescope have investigated it, including the discovery of Dark Spot 2 in March 2019. But they can only learn so much about Neptune from a distance of 29 AU. That's 30 times the distance from Earth to the Sun. Neptune, on the other hand, has long been overlooked for a variety of good reasons. Trajectory limitations are the first to consider. Only once every 12 years is it possible to go to Neptune at a low cost. It all comes down to Jupiter and Neptune's respective positions. Robotic exploration is likewise constrained by a small budget and reaching as far as Neptune is prohibitively expensive. The success of New Horizons at Pluto, where it found the largest known glacier in the solar system, a blue atmosphere and proof of an interior ocean of water ice demonstrates the value of a quick flyby mission. That is exactly what is being planned for the Trident mission, but it won't be heading to Neptune exclusively or even primarily. Triton, the largest of Neptune's 14 moons, which is considered geologically active and very definitely has an ocean beneath its surface, will be its intended target. Triton was once the sole known moon of Neptune, but thanks to Voyager 2's encounter, we now know that the gas giant has 14 other moons. Triton is the largest moon and Voyager 2 was able to capture images of two-thirds of its surface when it was there. Nayad, Thalassa, Despina, Galatia, Larissa, Hippocamp, Proteus, Nereid, Halamid, Sal, Lamida, Samanth and Niso are the other 13 moons of Neptune that are now known about. Besides being Neptune's largest moon, Voyager 2 observed ice volcanoes on Triton's surface, with one of the plumes measuring over five miles high. Triton is also very active geologically. Liquid nitrogen, dust or methane molecules are hypotheses to be the source of these ice volcanoes on the moon. Triton is thought to be what is known as a captured moon, meaning it did not form at the same time as Neptune and orbited the planet later. Since the remaining 13 moons of Neptune are all barren rocks, this captured moon theory may also explain why Triton is Neptune's largest moon and the only one that is geologically active. Triton is so enormous that it has room for all 13 of the remaining moons with 621 miles or 1,000 kilometers to spare. The Trident flyby, more or less modeled on the New Horizons flyby of Pluto in 2015, would occur in 2038, after a 2026 launch. Additionally, NASA is developing a mission to explore Neptune called Neptune Odyssey, with a target launch date of 2031. Using infrared and visible light sensors, the spacecraft will be capable of taking high-quality images of Neptune and its satellites. The spacecraft won't arrive at its destination until 2043, at which point this will take place. So if we take a closer look, the project will start in 10 more years and we will have to wait for initial results for roughly 20 years. But the crucial point is that Neptune Odyssey might end up being the sole endeavor that has a chance of recovering all of its expenses. Exploring its moon, Triton, is the most thrilling aspect of the entire exploration. Why, you might wonder? According to scientists, 
Diamonds may form in Neptune and Triton's ice layers. Their crystals fall exactly like Earth-like rain, creating a diamond ocean as a result. To pay for space travel, you would need to spend almost $50,000 on a 5-carat diamond. NASA requires only a heat-resistant robot. Do you recall the Wall E robot from the movie, for instance? In order to actually gather the diamonds for them, NASA will need to create something similar to that with heat-resistant features. Now is the moment to start thinking about investigating the ice giants up close and learning more about the fascinating diamond worlds of the solar system, as an other opportune alignment of the planets won't occur for another two generations. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.